Hi everyone, for today's video I'm going to focus on a portion of the ear here um, of this black Cocker Spaniel portrait that I've recently completed. Before I go on I just want to say a huge huge thank you to everybody's response to my Patreon channel. Every single person that's already joined up I am so so grateful. I've been working really hard to build a library so there's some videos there for people to watch as soon as they subscribe. There's over 15 hours of footage over there of various portraits so if Patreon is of interest then I'll pop a link in the description below. So for this video I'm just going to focus on this portion of the ear. Now this portrait is available over on Patreon, it is split into two parts. Each video is three hours long, so that's six hours of this portrait. Now the reason why I split this into two sections was because it was quite, you know, it was a bigger size and I wanted to focus on elements of this portrait. So there are lots of real time and considerably slower footage and I explain each process throughout. Now for this first part I've focused on what you can see here, so the eye, the top of the head and this ear. Now the reason for that is I get quite a lot of questions asking how I tackle spaniel ears and curly fur and that type of thing. So for this video that's what I'll focus on just this portion here. But if you would like more info on Patreon then don't hesitate to put any comments below or get in touch on my social media and I will forward you some more information. So when I am drawing spaniel ears of any kind really regardless of the colour I always tend to block in where my shadows are first. The reason for that is I like to map out exactly where the main sets of curls are. At this stage you want to be focusing on the clumps and clusters of that fur. Where do they gather and where do they sit? That's all we're doing at this stage. I'm not focusing on any kind of detail at all. Still making sure that I'm paying really close attention to that reference photo. And because most of the time this, the curls of the ear do not fall randomly. There are usually reasons for that. Now there's going to be dips in the ears which may create a shadow in certain areas. Some of the curls might be protruding more so than others which are going to be catching more of a highlight and that's because there might be clumps of fur under it compared to the, the fur that's next to it. So it's all about studying your reference photo and understanding why certain curls are lighter than others and why you have those shadows in certain areas. So that's all I'm doing at this stage is mapping everything out. I'm just creating good reference points so that when I look back at my reference photo, I can clearly see exactly what part of the ear and what curl I'm working on. Also, it's about paying attention to how that fur sits and how it gathers. This lower section of the ear here was more clumps of fur compared to the top section where you can see it's more individual strands of fur. You can see that they're still gathered together and they all follow the flow and direction of that fur where some areas of it are considerably longer fur strokes but there are still individual areas where you've got separate fur strokes to create that little bit more, you know, more of a detailed effect. Whereas this section of the ear at the bottom here was more shorter fur so it was more clumped together. Now the pencil brands that I'm using here is a mixture of a few sets. So at the moment there I'm using the Carbofello. I've then also got the Faber-Castell Pit Pastel Pencils, the Caran d'Ache Pastel Pencils and the Derwent. If you are just starting out with pastels I would recommend either getting a few of the Pit Pastel Pencils and the Carbofello and possibly some of the Derwent. You can't go wrong with any of those three sets really. I personally think they all blend really nicely together. The only reason why I don't mention the Caran d'Ache pencils is they are more pricey than the other brands and they do have some faults. You've heard me speak about it in my other videos where they contain these hard nuggets. So for that reason, combined with the price tag, and if you are starting out, I don't think necessarily you need to jump straight into those. My biggest piece of advice if you are starting out with pastels is your paper. That will make the biggest difference more so than your pastel pencils. If you do have a pastel pencil that has got one of these hard nuggets in it, it is no big deal, you can just sharpen it out. However, obviously it is going to be wasting some of your pencil. But more importantly, if you're not using the right paper, you are not going to get the results that you are after. I have tried other papers, cheaper papers, and you cannot get the layering like what you can on pastel mat. I've tried many different brands and nothing compares to it in my opinion. You can layer and layer and layer. You can therefore get that much more detail because you don't ever really get to the point where you fill the tooth of the paper. Now that being said, you can fill the tooth of the paper if you use your soft pastel sticks or your pan pastels with 
too much pigment or with a heavy hand and you fill the tooth of that paper too soon that is one of the instances where you do do that and again I speak about that in depth in my Patreon channel it's one of the reasons why I don't apply my base layers with those directly to the paper because it's something where if you do fill the tooth of that paper you cannot put your pencil you know your pastel pencil layers on top and build depth from there so if that does happen and you're finding your pencils are gliding over your paper then really your only option is to apply a workable fixative to put more tooth back to that paper. So there are instances just like what you've seen there where I will use a soft pastel stick on top of my already pencil layers and that was because the black Rembrandt soft pastel which is the brand that I like to use is much more darker and much more pigmented than any black um, pastel pencil that I have actually tried. So once I know that I've got my pencil layers on there and that I've got most of the detail in that area that I'm happy with, if I need that area to be super dark, I'll then use my soft pastel directly on the top of that as you saw. But I do it in this way because putting that pastel down first with a soft pastel stick, I really run the risk if you accidentally put a little bit too much pressure on that soft pastel stick, which is very easy to do given that they are a flatter surface and more difficult to control than a pencil I do find you can therefore fill the tooth of that paper really quickly but that is the only instance where I will apply this directly on top and not as my base layers and again it is a learning curve I did used to do that with my initial portraits when I first was new to pastels and I was still able to get detail on top but not like what I have with my more recent portraits where I haven't been applying my base layers with the soft pastel. Now you may not notice the difference if you put the two side by side but me when you're actually applying your layers you notice a difference at that time. Maybe not from the finished result if you're lucky enough that you've still got some tooth of the paper left. Obviously if you have filled that tooth of the paper completely your outcome is going to be different because you just won't be able to put your layers on top. Once I've blocked in with my darker values where my main sets of shadows are, I then start going over with various shades of grey and overlapping my lighter layers on top. What you don't want to be doing is heading straight for your brightest values first and are putting them directly on top of your darker values that you've just put down. Now the reason for that is you want to be building up gradually to create more depth. That's the whole point of having a, you know multiple layers. Each layer that you add creates more and more depth. So if you were to opt at this stage to apply your brighter layers down now, you're not going to have anywhere to advance to and any brighter values to put on top. So typically I will always keep my Caran d'Ache Chinese white pastel pencil to the side because I typically use that for my very brightest highlights. Now the reason for that is it's the most opaque that I found over the other pencils. Now that means that because it's a softer lead, it is much more punchier and in colour so it grips that paper that much easier so just be aware that they are a softer lead so they do break quite easily compared to the other brands but that is a pencil that I will put to the side just so that I know that I've not used my brightest highlights too soon and I've always got an extra value to add on top should I need it. When you are applying your layers on top you need to pay close attention to your reference photo and notice whether or not it is a warm highlight or a cold highlight. So what I mean by that is where that colour approximately falls on the colour wheel. If it's more towards red, then it's going to be more of your warmer colour, you know, reds, oranges and yellows, that's more of a warmer hue, more of a tint to it. If on the colour wheel it's more down to your blues and your purples, it's more of a colder colour. Now depending on where these curls on spaniel ears or any breed like this fall, they are going to catch the light in slightly different ways. If it's more towards a shadowed area, typically they're going to have more of a purple or a blue tint to it. And if it's catching more of the light, depending on, again, the type of light, if it's on a sunny day, for instance, you're probably going to have some warmer values in there. So you're going to be opting for more of your creams, more of a redder, oranger type of highlight, more so than your blues and your purples. If you don't recognise and notice these values as easy, use an eyedropper tool and pinpoint various areas in the you know let's say you are working on an ear on that ear and you will then be able to clearly see what sections are going to be more warmer and what ones are going to be more cooler but if you were to put the same value all over you then create more of a flat portrait so just because one area has a cooler highlight doesn't necessarily mean that that should be all over the portrait and all over that section that you're working on so use the eyedropper tool if that's something that is of use and that will definitely help you to isolate your layers and where that colour needs to go in that area. And this is something that I do cover in my Patreon videos, the reason why I'm putting that colour down in that area. It's something that I feel 
it's quite important because like I say it adds that extra three dimension to your portrait. If you are drawing a black subject like this the paper colour that you choose can definitely help in making your layering process that much easier. So depending on the type of background that you may have that might affect the paper choice but for something like this I opted for the dark grey pastel matte just because it was already more of the mid-tone value so it helps for you to put your darks and your lights and judge them that much easier. I would have also used the light grey as well for this because again it's of a similar type of tone. I also like the tooth of these two colours as well. I find the white is actually a little bit more smoother than these colours and the darker ones such as the anthracite and the wine I think they call it and the darker blue they definitely seem to have a little bit more tooth than the other papers. Now that doesn't necessarily make a whole you know, much difference but it is something to bear in mind if you are used to one colour. I certainly notice it because I mainly use the dark grey and the brown. If I was to then use the other darker colours which would get you know, a bit more of a toothier surface to it, you can notice it. However, you can still layer, apply your colour in exactly the same way. It's just something to bear in mind because it will feel slightly differently when you are using your pencils. But I haven't noticed any difference. The outcome would, you know, is still the same. Personally, I haven't found any difference. So you can see just how much of a layering process it is. I'm starting to pay really close attention to the more of the fur that's closest to the viewer. So what you want to be drawing is everything closest to the skin first and each layer that you add is working up towards what's going to be closest to when you, for instance, if you were to touch that pet. So that, the whiskers will go on last because they overlap everything else. And then the layers on top, like what I'm using now with my white pit pastel pencil, are the very top of the fur. There is nothing that overlaps these highlights. So that's why they are the, at the brightest because they're therefore catching that much more light. Now one big tip, especially if you are working on an ear like this where the fur does change directions in various different ways, it travels and flows in various different directions, turn your artwork and your reference photo upside down and your brain will actually then just focus on the abstract shapes rather than when your artwork is up its normal way, your brain is thinking it does not look like an ear and you start to get really it's difficult to then move on from that because you don't feel yourself progressing it you don't think it doesn't look like the reference photo because your brain is thinking you know what an ear looks like turn your artwork upside down and your brain will be forced to see the abstract shapes once you've then worked on an area that you've been struggling with and you turn your artwork and your reference photo back around the right way you will then realize that it looks now like that reference photo so you can see that this doesn't contain a whole load of color it's just mainly focusing on your darks and your lights that's why if you're worried about picking the exact right colour, it's your contrast that's more important. If you don't get your dark values in dark enough and your lights light enough, your portrait will be flat. That's You can have your portrait the perfect colour, but if it's flat and doesn't have the contrast, it's not going to look as realistic. If you get contrast in that portrait, but your colour is very slightly off, that is going to be more obvious than the other way around. Now the reason for that is you could take that photo of that animal in a slightly different setting, slightly different lighting, and the colour would be, again, a slightly different colour. So, but the contrast would be similar in that the darks and the highlights would be important. It would be, it's quite hard to get a photograph of a black animal because it can, the shadows can be quite dark all over. But if you get a reference photo like here where there's nice variations in it, you want to be focusing on where those lights and darks are. They also are in a that place for a reason. They're not random. So your darker areas are dark because there's usually a you know a pocket in that part of the ear. It dips in like what I've mentioned. Above the eye, it's typically quite a bit darker because that's where the eyebrow sits. And again, below the eye where the ear meets the head is often quite dark because the ear overlaps the face. So there's various reasons as to why these highlights and shadows are, are in their place and it's not random. If you don't get them in the right place, ultimately you're not going to actually be following the structure of that dog. So it, the finished outcome is going to be very different. Honestly, it comes with confidence. The more portraits you do, the more drawing that you do, you just become more confident with which colours that you need, which pencils you pick up. There are still portraits where I'll put down a layer of colour, start using a pencil and I'm like, nope, that's completely the wrong colour. But it's no big deal. When you're using pastel mat, you know, it can be fixed. Anything can be fixed. Unless you put a hole in the paper or you spill something on it, layers can be fixed. So just pick up a different colour. 
and go over it. It's really easy to blend everything out so it's almost like that mistake didn't even happen. So this section here shows you how I'm applying my base layers. As I mentioned before, not applying the soft pastel stick directly to the paper. I instead prefer to sand it down on a bit of fine grit sandpaper to the side of me, mix the various colours together to get the colour or the tone that I'm after, and then I'm directly applying that to my paper with either a soft tool or an eye makeup applicator. I am going to be investing in some, just a few of the pan pastels to give them a go. I think from what I've read that the pigment is much softer than the soft pastel sticks by the time they're sanded down on the sandpaper. So if that's the case, I still think with pan pastels, you're going to have to be careful not to fill the tooth off the paper too soon. But as I say, I am going to buy some when I next do my art order and I will let you know how I find those for my base layers. But the principle is very much the same with what I'm doing in that I am mixing various colours just as you would with pan pastels and applying them directly to my paper with my soft tools. So what I'm actually using here is an eye makeup applicator rather than a soft tool just because I ran out of the soft tools. Depending on the ones that you buy, the eye makeup applicators can work really well, but just be aware that there are some that actually, by the time you apply it to the paper, some of the pastel can fall off and down towards the bottom of your, your easel, which obviously isn't ideal. So there are some that are going to be better than others, but we all know that the soft tools are perfect from the start. You haven't got to worry about that. So it just depends on which one you prefer to use. But if you are using an eye makeup applicator instead, if you are finding that the pigment falls off of it, just be aware that it's probably the tool that you're using rather than your technique or your materials as in the pastels. I hope this video was of use. I really would appreciate it if you could give the video a thumbs up. It really does help. And if you want to get notified of future content, don't forget to hit the subscribe button in the bottom corner and the bell button as well. Thank you. Bye.